on December the 8th, 1980, Annie Leibovitz, celebrated photographer, went to the Dakota building in New York to photograph John Lennon and Yoko Ono for their forthcoming album. It was going to be covered in Rolling Stone. She'd been there a few days earlier taking some pictures, but had an idea about capturing the intimacy between John and Yoko. Annie had first met John Lennon way back in 1970 when she was just a, a new photographer learning her way and, and being quite nervous and John had gone out of his way to make her feel relaxed and comfortable and that had informed the way that she'd photographed up until that point and there was you know there was a rapport between them so she felt able to you know ask John and Yoko if they wouldn't mind posing nude much like they'd done previously and Yoko was a bit hesitant about this idea. She said, look, you know, I'll, I'll do topless, but that's as far as it goes. John was quite fine. And so Annie was kind of stuck. She said, look, okay, Yoko, just, you, you keep your clothes on. And they did a couple of images. Annie showed John one of the Polaroids. And he turned to her and said, look, wow, this, this image perfectly captures our relationship. John cuddled into Yoko in almost a fetal position, her fully clothed, because him totally, you know, nude. Before she left, John turned to her and said, look, you know, I know that Rolling Stone, they just really wanted to have this about me, but this is a joint album between myself and Yoko, and I, and I really want Yoko to be on the cover with me. So they arranged to go and see the transparencies later on. And Annie went on her way and John went off to a recording studio. And later that evening, Annie got a recall saying that a person matching John's description had been admitted to Roosevelt Hospital with a gunshot wound. And of course, that was the fatal wound that ended up killing him. After this tragic event, Rolling Stone were at somewhat of a loss of what to do. They thought about putting... You, John, just a picture that Annie had taken previously on the cover. And then she said, look, you know, John said to me that he wants both Yoko and himself on this cover. And they looked through the images and they, they had this photograph, which is now something to become iconic. And they put it on the cover after checking with Yoko that it was okay. And she said, absolutely fine, please do, you know, put this on there. And that kind of really cemented certainly as I'm concerned, Annie's place in a public consciousness, a wider world beyond just the music and the politics that she'd been photographing up until that point. Although these days Annie Leibovitz is most known for her glamorous fashion and magazine photography, her start was actually as a photojournalist in the late 1960s, early 70s, working for Rolling Stone she got a job there almost by accident, you know, under duress. She was asked to go and show some of her work to, to them in the hope of getting a job. And that's where she cut her teeth on doing you know, gigs like following the Rolling Stones around, doing all sorts of things, a world away from the fashion and celebrity portraiture that we see today. Her background in the arts, of, of going to art school, of learning about painting and, and absorbing the work of people like Robert Frank, you know, informed her photography. And that's a, a, a series, a feeling that you see throughout her career. My first introduction to Annie Leibovitz was through her conceptual photography that I kind of went, wow, you know, who is this person? She was not quite as well known as she is today. And, and I sort of looked at it and go, well, this is, this is really kind of cool work. And I wondered about how she found these ideas, how photographers like her came up with this. There's a very cool book that I have called Annie Leibovitz at work. And she shares within these pages, thoughts about photography, some sort of insights. I always found that extremely useful to, to find out what a photographer is thinking. And she talks about these conceptual portraits at length, saying that to begin with, she was talking to Lawrence Schiller, who's a very famous photographer. He was talking you know, about having to think about a shoot before you go there. And he used an example of an ejector seat that was designed to be fired from an airplane on the ground. 
And he knew that you'd only have a couple of seconds to take pictures of this. And rather than being like all the other photographers, you know, shooting just a thing going up in the sky, he built this 150 foot tower, put a 70 millimeter camera on top of there, that was taking frames as this thing rocketed <laughs> towards them. So this is where Annie gets these ideas from, that it's necessary to do your homework, that if you're going to photograph a dancer, to, you know, go and watch them dance. If, you're, if she's photographing a musician, to, you know, go and listen to their, their music. It's within those moments that there is a raw nucleus of an idea that can surface. One of the first photographs of Annie Leibovitz's that I really you know, became familiar with was the Blues Brothers, of, you know, Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi. And I always thought, like, oh, this is pretty cool, you know, that they were always up for this. And, and it turns out that at the time, they were taking themselves very seriously. The Blues Brothers album had come out and they, they were seeing themselves as more actors and serious musicians than comedians. Of course, Annie kind of went, oh, you know, it'd be quite fun to paint everybody blue. And, you know, it's, it's a somewhat on the nose play on words. But it's an iconic photograph that you can't imagine. It perfectly sums up everything. And yet, John Belushi was not keen on this idea. He, I think, under duress, was, you know, painted blue. And according to Annie, he lasted about six frames and then stormed off in a huff, not seeing the funny side of it at all, and didn't talk to Andy Leibovitz for like another six months. And what I find really interesting about that story is that Annie said that, you know, that at the time she was young and cocky and didn't really think twice about the ramifications of what she was asking people to do. And it's gone so far as like saying that she would have no idea these days how to actually go about these things. So sometimes, you know, <laughs> ignorance is bliss. There is another photograph that I absolutely adore of Annie's, and that's that one of Meryl Streep, where she's got that, that white face paint on, you know, the actor's kind of mask thing, and she's pulling at her skin. And I can, she, it's great because Annie shares us the story, you know, Meryl Streep was, she was new, she was just starting to become famous, and, and was feeling, I think, quite uncomfortable. The, the shoot wasn't really going very well. In fact, Meryl had postponed it twice already. There's a lesson in here where Annie talks about, you know, chatting with, with Meryl Streep and Meryl going, look, you know, I, I, I don't really want to be anybody. I don't want to be me. I just want to be nothing. I just want to be an actor. Meryl kind of noticed, oh, look, there's, there's lots of books about clowns around. There was some white face paint. And that's where the idea was born of painting that white paint on to Meryl's face. That she could be just the blank canvas, just the embodiment of an actor. You see this a lot through Annie's conceptual work, certainly from this, this period. You know, there's very famous photographs of, of Whoopi Goldberg in the bath. You know, that was another one that, that just kind of, it started in one place and ended up in another. There's a wonderful photograph of Steve Martin, which I adore. I mean, I love Steve Martin and I loved Annie Leibovitz's work from this period. And she shares the story of going and talking to Steve that, you know, he's, he's quite into art and he just bought this giant painting that he was extremely pleased about, you know, wow, I really like this. And he kind of sort of talked about like, oh, maybe I could be in the picture. Maybe I could be in that painting. And Annie initially was a little bit reticent because she had tried this with Mick Jagger uh, a few years ago, trying to put him into a Turner sunset painting. And the, apparently the, the makeup artist had spent four hours, you know, doing all the, the, the painting and all that kind of stuff to make him blend into this picture. And, and he lasted about 30 seconds when the shoot started and said, I've had enough and I'm going. <laughs> so, so you can imagine that, you know, Annie's a little bit, not so sure, but she gets a set painter down from, from Disney and they say, look, what can you do? The set painter goes plop, 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 and does and a couple of brush strokes. Says, that's it, I'm done, I'm off, I have to go back to work now, right? And that picture is glorious. Those strokes and those brushes just work perfectly. There are so many stories like this, peppered throughout Annie's career, of Sting walking around in the desert and just taking off all his clothes, as Sting is wont to do, and Annie being reminded, oh, it reminds me of those Irvin Penn 
images of the, those Amazonian tribes where they, they cake themselves in, in mud and, you know, going, well, let's, let's try things like that. Of, of Bette Midler, you know, doing a, a, a movie about Janis Joplin, The Rose, and they're ordering all these roses for her to, you know, lie down in. And only discovering when these roses are delivered a couple of hours before the shoot, that they all still have their thorns attached. They haven't been dethorned, just they're frantically trying to get rid of all the thorns. When I'm searching for images on, on Annie Leibovitz and reading articles about her and watching videos and, and reading the comments on my own videos where Annie Leibovitz features, often there are accusations about how she has no talent, that the work that she produces is only fated because of the people that are in it or the circumstances, much like John Lennon's photograph, that, you know, that really it, she's nothing more than just a, a button presser, especially these days. She has a, a huge team setting everything up and she just swans in and takes a picture. Now, I found when I was younger that I, I, I felt similar. I thought that, you know, then you, I, I could take these photographs if I wanted to. All I need is John Belushi, you know, Dan Aykroyd, Steve Martin, access to them. And, and I could do it and I could just be as, as famous. And that idea that people have no talent, I think, is, is, is an unfair accusation. It's fine to not like a photographer's work. But when you look at Annie Leibovitz, she has spent an entire career working at things, speaking to photographers, absorbing every single piece of information. She has made no bones about the fact that she, she knew nothing when she was getting started. And yes, maybe it was lucky that she turned up on the right day, in the right kind of frame of mind at Rolling Stone, that she was almost literally pushed through the door. And she sat there, worked at it, absorbed the, the learnings and the teachings and, and the, 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 the help that other photographers have passed on over time throughout her career, that she's drawn on this, this deep passion for photography. I find her work can be sometimes superficial, but other times it can be really powerful. And at the very least, it's always evolving. It's always changing. It may not always be to everybody's tastes, but she isn't a photographer who has just stood still. One of the photographers that Annie Leibovitz has drawn inspiration from is Irvin Penn. And if you'd like to know more about his fantastic photography and what he did to overcome an imposter syndrome, check out this video over here. Thank you ever so much for watching and I will see you again soon.